morning. Good morning. That is a cute kid. If, 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 he, if he does, uh, I, I, I'll just take that as an amen if he does it while I'm speaking. Um, but it is, it is good to be back. It's good to be back home. Um, I've, 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 I've had the chance of studying um, and improving my faith in the, in the field of apologetics. Uh, at Apologetic Express in Montgomery, but you know, I miss Florida. Uh, Florida's a great state. I miss, I miss home, and I miss being with you guys. Um, this is a really kind congregation. I've been told in several, several times after speaking uh, the class this morning, I was told that they don't bite, and I like that. They all are very friendly. This is a great congregation to be at. The last time I was here, if, if, if y'all remember back, uh, around the latter part of May, we talked about how we as Christians are called to be committed, um, committed to Christ and how we live and, and how we are uh, directed to live in a life that is in such a way as to be subject to or submissive to Christ, almost in the, uh, this idea of a, of a marriage is conveyed there, at least in, in, in my study. And like I said, you know, I'm speaking from, from my studying and not necessarily from experience because I, you know, I was not married. And uh, just as I didn't necessarily have too much of experience in that, in that kind of married type discussion, the topic this morning is a perfect man. And I don't have that much experience in, being, in classifying in that way either. A perfect man. So if you will, please turn to uh, James chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. That's going to be the, our main text, is, is James chapter 3. But this idea of a perfect man, it almost sounds paradoxical, does it not? You know, it's, uh, or uh, what's, what's the word, an oxymoron, I think is what they say, you know, like a jumbo shrimp, a perfect man. Uh, I'm, I am speaking to the, the married couples, you know, and their wife probably thinks that their husband is a perfect man. But the, the, the word perfect here is used a little bit differently than the way that we normally associate that word. In fact, you know, the, in the way that we normally associate that word with, without being, you know, ha without having a fault of any kind uh, and perfect in nature, I think that only pertains to one man, and, and he lived and died and resurrected uh, a couple thousand years ago, I, I, I think that this this word "perfect" here is used a little bit differently. So let's let's dive into this text a little bit, and I'm going to start off by reading the first couple of verses here. It says here in James chapter three, one through two, "Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as much, that as such we will bring or we will incur a stricter judgment, for we all stumble in many ways." If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now this, this goes without saying, of course, but I'm going to say it anyways. I'm not a perfect man. I, I, never, I never want to ever preach a, a, a lesson about something that I, I... I never want to preach what I, I will not hear myself. And in this, and in this study... I think that I, I saw that I could greatly benefit from, from learning these kind of attributes that James is kind of describing here. And I, and I hope that y'all kind of feel that same way as well. So let's, let's kind of really dive into this. So I, I was studying this word perfect because that's, it's a, that's, a, that's a unique word used there. So I, I, I kind of studied it a little bit. And from what I've, I've gleaned from my studies... It talks about this idea of completeness. I did look up the Greek word. I have not taken a single Greek class, but it's uh, tele teleios, I think is how it's pronounced. But it's, it's, it's talking about this idea of completeness, almost to the fact in which one would not waver even to the end, is the word that's kind of being denoted there in James chapter 3. So you have this idea of being complete when he's talking about this idea of perfection. And that makes sense, does it not? You know, are we, are we as Christians not trying to attain this idea or train, you know, train our lifestyle to imitate this idea of being complete? Um, I, I, love, I love the passage in Ephesians chapter 4. We'll, we'll turn there later on uh, this morning. But in Ephesians chapter 4, it's talking about this idea of, of, of maturing um, to, try to, to try to be more like Christ 
um, and, and, and measuring ourselves up to the standard of Christ. And that's kind of what this is kind of describing here. It's talking about this idea of, of trying to attain this idea of this complete nature. You know, I, I gleaned a lot from, and, and I'm not trying to promote this, this great material, but I don't want to say, uh, let me articulate my thoughts here for a second. <laughs> but there was a, a, a commentary written by Wayne Jackson. And I think that he, he phrased all this exceedingly well. But he talked about this idea of, 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 of matureness. And he brought this idea uh, that, that, I, that helped me a lot with this text in, in illuminating that in Ephesians chapter 4. Just trying to give credit where credit's due. But anyways, this idea, going back to James chapter, James chapter 3, verse 2. So we as Christians, we're all try, striving to obtain this idea, uh, this, this concept of completeness, right? That's difficult. It's, in fact, it's, it's, it's exceedingly, exceedingly difficult. You know, we as, we as men, we as humans, we try to accomplish things that would bring us a great amount of prestige. You know, we, 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 we read about people that are, are, are climbing Mount Everest. We read about people that will survive in this rugged terrain and trying to fare in the, in the harshest conditions possible for this idea of, of, uh, of this accomplishment. You know, I'm, look at what I was able to do. I was able to climb to the top of Mount Everest where there's oxygen depletion. Yet, I think an even more difficult task that's never really noticed in today's society is being able to bridle, being able to master, being able to submit one's tongue and what we say and how we act in a, in a manner that brings Christ glory. That is a difficult thing. It is a massive accomplishment. You know, you know we as Christians, we're, we're, we're told in Matthew chapter 12, let's, let's turn really quick there. Matthew chapter 12, verses 33 through 37, the importance of bridling our tongue. Starting in verse 33. Again, that was Matthew chapter 12 and verse 33. Either make the tree good and it's and it's fruit good or make the tree bad and its fruit bad for the tree is known by its fruit you brood of vipers how can you being evil speak what is good for the mouth speaks out of what which fills the heart the good man brings out of his good treasure what is good and the evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil but I tell you that every careless word that people speak they shall give an account for and the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. That's, an, that's, a, that's a terrifying. I talk a lot. And, you know, I, I talk a lot. Sometimes not necessarily with fully thinking about my words. I mean, you, you hear me spitting and sputtering up here uh, occasionally. But it's difficult. Every, every word we're going to have to give an account for. It. It just talks about the significance of this task. And going back to James chapter 3, we, we read about the judgment that, we, that people, teachers of the truth will, will face. We're going to be accountable for what we say and how we, how we say it. Um, and again, there's an emphasis on the second thing as well. What we say and how we say it. Because the Bible also illuminates how we are supposed to teach. So going back to James chapter 3, and, and, and again, I'm just, I'm just talking a little bit broad here about the importance and significance of this topic because today a lot of attention is, is brought to those who cause a lot of attention they speak really loud, they may speak really eloquently, they get a lot of attention from others but what they're saying there's, there's, a, there's a great possibility what they're saying is not true and they may get a lot of attention from others and it's it's really kind of backwards. I think more attention should be shown to those who are able to bridle their tongue and, and fully be able to think about what they're saying 
understanding the the implications of, of, of judgment and what they say, more more attention and praise should be brought to those people rather than the people that make noise, but that tends, tends not to be the case. But sometimes I think we as, we, we as a church, um, I know I as a person, forget every word, every word that I say I have to account for. You know, we, we should we should really I, I believe that we would all greatly benefit from from understanding that. Understanding that that bridling your tongue when you, and when you're able to do that according to James chapter two or James chapter three, verse two, you may be you're going to be able to bridle your whole body as well. And it talks about the significance and, and James also illuminates this idea and the following passages and in verse three. Now if we put in, into bits uh, into horses' mouths so that they will be able to obey us. Again, such a small thing can control such a large thing. It even used, uses this idea of a vessel controlling the rudder. You seize the rudder and you seize the vessel, and you can steer it where you want to go. So I'm trying to, I'm really trying to promote this idea. If you are able to bridle your tongue, that is something to be proud of. That's something to work toward. That's something to be con- constantly trying to improve in, in that area. It is a very, very important idea. And in fact, not, not only are we said to be judged for what we say, like it said in Matthew chapter 12, not only do we have to be given account in that way, and not only is, is, is this topic really important in that sense that it, it, you know, obviously what we say will bring back forth and, and we'll be judged for that. Not only is it important in that sense, but I think that what we say can distinguish us as Christians. In fact, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4 really quick. I think a, a Christian can distinguish himself or herself and what they say. Again, let's, talk, let's, let's start in verse 13. Again, this, this idea is, is talking about the maturity here. Very similar to this idea of perfection used in James. In fact, it's almost the same exact word in the Greek. In verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of stature, and just a side note, the word mature there, and some of y'all's translations, it may be perfect. Um, You know, we said said that Greek word that I probably didn't pronounce correctly. Please don't hold me to that. To, to, To lay off. The, the word used there in James chapter 3 to describe perfect, mature here is teleion, which is, again, talking about this idea of complete from what I've gathered in my studies. So very similar parallel type topic here. But anyways, I, I, I'll start again in verse 13. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ, as a result... We are no longer to be children tossed to and fro um, here and there by waves and carried out about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But here's the thing. So, you know, we're, we're not supposed to be children tossed about by what people say. Uh, you know, that Christians are supposed to be able to rightly divide the word of truth and see and, and glean out what is true, right? So... We are not to be as children who will follow what anybody will say, but rather, how how does how does Paul like distinguish how a Christian when, when it comes to speech? It's not the person who, who who will listen to anything over here. The the let's turn to verse fifteen. But speaking the truth in love, do y'all do y'all get this idea of a contrast there? We're not supposed to be children tossing to and fro by every every whim of doctrine. You know this and that. And that. But, it's cre- creating a contrast there, but speaking the truth in love, that's how we are supposed to be. We are to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, sorry my voice cracked there, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. 
bridling our speech is of the utmost importance. That's what's able to distinguish us and the world. Because the, the world will, will, will turn to what, whatever whim, whatever, whatever's being promoted, whatever. If, if it sounds eloquent, if it sounds nice, turn to it, is, 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 is what the immature person says. But this idea of matureness, of completeness, rather, this kind of idea of perfection is rather to those who spend the time on the words. Spend their time to articulate them, trying to understand them, to where they can adequately and rightly teach. Because that person is going to be able to understand and know that we are held accountable for what we teach. So again, this idea is, is of the utmost importance. And then you and, and, and we read later on in Ephesians chapter four uh, about how we, you know we're not supposed to walk as the Gentiles walked in the futility of their mind, their understanding being darkened. This idea of understanding, under, understanding, especially with words, is of the utmost importance. So this I say and I affirm together. I'm starting in verse seventeen. So this I say and affirm together with the, with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of their ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And you read later on uh, a little bit more about this idea. And then you get to verse 29 where it reads, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only, only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do you think that the church can benefit from, from learning the implications of that verse? Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification. You know, we, talk, we talked about, yes, saying the right words, but isn't there also, aren't we also charged to teach those things in love, like it said in verse 15, but speaking the truth in love? Sometimes we can speak the truth. I've, I've, I, I, again, I don't know with this congregation what the struggles are and what, what areas we can improve in. But sometimes I, I found myself guilty in other and other members of the Lord's church where we would we would preach the truth. You, you know the truth just fine. But the way that it's brought about, the way that it's spoken, may not have been in the best way. It's a difficult thing to speak in love. It's a difficult thing to love sometimes. <coughs> you know, I, I, I'm going to kind of steal the words of, of Jeff Miller. He was one of my mentors at AP. And he, you know, he talked about wielding the, the, uh, the sword of the Spirit, you know, the Word of God, right? And sometimes, you know, we as Christians get this idea, we want to cut people down, we want to, we want to cut the evil sayers down. And uh, we, we want to use the sword of the Spirit. Uh, we, want to, we want to cut down false doctrine. Um, cut it at its root. Demolish it, destroy it. That's how we want to use our sword sometimes. But rather, he said, more skill... He created this idea. More skill is used to those who can use such a sharp point as more of a scalpel in someone's heart rather than just a brute sword. But sometimes we have this idea where we just, you know, I want, I want to stand up. I want to fight for, I want to fight for Christ. I don't, I, don't, I don't care if what I say is all that eloquent. You know, I would just hold my Bible, dear. You know, fine. That's, that's, that's kind of sometimes how we go about in evangelism when we, I, I think that we forget, hey, supposed to tr speak the truth in, in love. <laughs> That's that, that. In fact, that, that that love is this idea that undergirds almost anything in Christianity. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter thirteen, that whole chapter necessitates the importance of having love. You know what? What profit is you if you if you do this 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 and you and you, and you are without love? What does it profit you? And again, I don't I don't I don't I don't want to. I don't want anyone to walk away feeling like I'm, I'm preaching towards you. I'm preaching towards myself. Just even it, 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 it more so than I'm saying out here. This is a hard thing. 
I, I, the, the more I've studied this topic, and it's difficult for me to articulate the words here in front of you because I've, I've, I've tried to do my, my diligence in studying this topic to the fullness of its implications and trying to understand it right in its own context. But this is hard. This is, it is really hard. But sometimes, sometimes we're we're so loose with our words, and that's that's that shouldn't be the case. Let's go going back to James chapter three, really quick. We're we're, we're now leaving Ephesians chapter four and going to, to chapter three of James. You know, we read later on. You know, talking about just how how important this this one principle is, and I don't I don't necessarily believe from from what I have studied. I, I I would say that one could not be complete, one could not be perfect if one does not bridle and get this down. Um, but I, I from from what I've gleaned from the passage, if you are able to accomplish this, you can accomplish the other things and, and bridle your body if you're able to bridle your tongue. So again, it talks about in, in verse. And verse 5, so also the tongue is a, a, a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. For every, for every species of beasts and, and birds of, rep, and, of reptiles and, and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God, well, with it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From, from the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Sometimes aren't we guilty of that? I'm guilty of that. I, I don't let every word that I say, I, I, it, it, not every word that I use is, is proper and necessary for edification like it should be. Sometimes, sometimes it's really easy to let our, our negative opinions and possibly uh, evil type, wrong, wicked opinions may come out of our out of our mouth and degrade and, and kind of debunk a brother in Christ, even someone in the world. I like to joke a lot, but that's even in that regard, I'm trying to work in that. Again, I'm trying to work on all this stuff because it is so difficult. To understand what James is saying, no wonder he says that a, a complete man is able to bridle his tongue. This is hard. From out, from out of the abundance of the heart comes the, the words from your mouth, right? There's, there's just so much in this text. It's difficult, and I'm still running out of time. I don't want to be that guy to, to keep you all past time. But this, this, this idea is, is just so crucial and so important. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to glean back to the words from Matthew chapter 12 and, verse, and verses 33 through 37. A good tree can't bring forth bad fruit and a bad tree can't bring forth good fruit. We as Christians, from, from, from this study, have, have, have we gleaned that we're either going to show, we're, by our words we will show who we are from, who, are, who we are with, and, or, or vice versa. Just, just as the in the Ephesians in, in Ephesians chapter four, those who, who are uh, distinguished by by those who were speaking the truth in love, and those who were turning about from every form of doctrine and such and such, and and just as the good and bad tree is distinguished by the fruit in which it bears, we as Christians are all all all, all as much as true in, in the words in which we say. We are judged by our words. So I implore you, brethren, I'm for, uh, and, and to, to pray for one another and to pray for me that we may all try to have this idea and strive for this idea of perfection, of maturity, and understanding what we're saying, the implications of what we're saying, and how we're saying it. I'm running out of time.
Um, so I guess I'll, I will close with that. But let us all strive to also promote this idea of unity. And, and that's also, I, I, I don't have time to adequately address that in Ephesians chapter 4, but that's what a lot of this is, is started. In fact, the, the beginning part of Ephesians chapter 4 is talking about unity and how our, our speech can, can also influence in that within the body of Christ. But if there's, if there's anything that we, we learned from this, uh, this lesson, is that our words matter. Our words matter. We should strive to work and to continue to grow, continue to, to, to study. Because all this matters. Thank you so much uh, for our attention. And I, and I pray that we all try to help each other grow in this regard. If you have not had the chance to put on Christ in baptism, if, if, if one would like to change one's life and, 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 and live a life in which one turns away from the world and the wickedness they're in, and turn to a life that is more obedient and harmonious with God's word. I implore you to do so. We're, we are charged to hear the word. Romans chapter 10 verse 17. Believe uh, not only the word. But believe that Jesus is God's son. That he is and, and did exactly what God uh, t- told him to do. And, if, and, and John chapter 8 verse 24 talks a little bit more about that. And then we're charged to repent. Unless we repent we will all likewise perish. According to Luke 13 3. And then confess Christ before men. He who confesses Christ before men, he will, um, he will confess you before his Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies him before men, he, he will deny him before his Father who is in heaven. According to Matthew chapter 10, verses 30, 32 through 33. And, like, and then we are to be baptized, fully immersed, for the remission of our sins, according to Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. But if, if one has already become a New Testament Christian and would like to come forward, um, because, of, because of a sin and a certain nature and that they would like to address the congregation, we also implore for that as well as we stand and sing.